Hello and welcome to the Time for Marketing podcast, the podcast that brings you the best marketing conference speakers and allows them to sum up their presentations in five minutes. My name is Peter and I'll be your host for today as I was in the previous 41 episodes. And yes, this is the episode number 42, bringing you the answers to everything and anything. And if you don't understand what that means, you should read the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, an excellent and one of the funniest books around. Um, before we go and I introduce you to my today's guest, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, you can, as any other podcast, subscribe to the podcast and enjoy the episodes every two weeks. And of course, if you think that other people should hear about the podcast, go and give it a rating at the whatever app you're using, or maybe just email the timeformarketing.com domain to your friends or co-workers that work in marketing. Enough about me. With me today is Despina from Inaki. Despina, hello and welcome to the podcast. Hello, and thank you very much for having me. I'm very glad to have you here. How is uh, Munich and how is Germany? Uh, it's pretty snowy, at least here in Munich, which is quite strange for April, but we're trying to make the most of it. <laughs> All right, excellent. It's snowy here too. I was uh, really, um, it was fun to bring the uh, child to the kindergarten because, of course, snow and everything. So I was almost a bit late to the uh, recording. Um, <laughs> Dispina, you are working at this as a senior SEO consultant at the boutique agency in Munich. Um, why do you, why SEO? Wow, that's a very good question. Actually, I kind of landed on SEO like many people a little bit randomly. So I started mostly with offsite and PR when I first came to Munich, working then mostly on the offsite side of things. And then gradually then tweaked a little bit around with content. And then I saw that actually seeing how playing with content helped us in the rankings. Then I got more and more interested in the more technical aspects of SEO. And I was really happy to be uh, really lucky to be with a company that really enabled us to play around different positions, see what we like mostly. And then I ended up in the SEO team there. So it was an in-house team. And then uh, just because I wanted to see how this applies to other potential business models and clients as well, I said, okay, let me give the agency life a try. And then since then, I've been uh, in the agency side of things that I, is quite interesting, I have to admit. What is the uh, thing that you do the most right now? What, what part of SEO or what things do you do the most and what are the things that you enjoy the most in SEO? Mm, uh, Things that we do quite often are audits, so technical audits of websites and um, uh, relaunches also to a big extent. What I really like, however, is that then when we have clients for a longer time, I can really make the website 100% perfect. So speaking then about optimizing for speed, because that's something that usually clients tend to prioritize once the big chunk of technical issues regarding crawling are already tackled. So I'd say, yeah, mostly then working on speed and then on really bringing the domain where it should be on a technical level. The, I think there's a giant buzz on the internet about the um, Google shutting down Google Universal Analytics in a year. Is this something that um, your phones and messengers are ringing um, from your clients or how big is that? I mean, on the other hand, you're in Germany. Um, are your clients still big on Google Analytics or have they switched away already? It's a 50-50, I would say, because of the entire um, uh, patent shoots. Oh, my God. The, the word GDPR. Word. GDPR, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, of the whole GDPR question, we have already a lot of clients who have switched to other solutions, but we still have quite a big part of our clients that are on analytics. So uh, we start already to get some questions. Hey, how are we going to tackle this? Are you affected? What do we need to prepare? And so on and so forth. So it's quite interesting to see now how the land, the landscape is going to move uh, with the switch. Let's see mm. how it goes. Mm. 
that's going to be a fun year for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've invited you to the podcast you, because you had a presentation as at the SMX uh, conference in Munich um, with the title Content Creation Beyond the Checklist. How was the conference? Uh, yeah, just how was the conference? The conference was really, really nice. I mean, SMX always delivers in terms of the speakers, of the content that is out there that is getting shared. Um, unfortunately, the first day I did not have so much time to go and follow through a lot of talks because I was preparing uh, mine and being quite stressed about it. Uh, but then uh, the day of the presentation, I actually sat through a couple of sessions and they were really, really cool. So mm. always a lot of things to learn in SMX. All right. Let's go directly to the content. Despina, here are your five minutes. Okay. So uh, speaking of the presentation that we had in SMX, it was about content. And as the title goes, how to optimize it uh, along the entire creation process. So looking a little bit beyond the checklist per se, but seeing how we incorporate that in the process itself. So with the latest uh, Google Core updates, focusing a lot of content and with EAT playing a bigger, to uh, being quite a big topic in the last couple of years, it's only natural for SEOs to work uh, extensively with it and to try and to incorporate this, uh, the EAT guidelines of Google in their day-to-day -day work. And there's already so much good work out there that has been done, right? There's lists, there's articles, studies about uh, how to optimize for EAT, any correlations that we see uh, between different factors in EAT. But what we did was try to have a different approach. So see it in a little bit of another way and see how this can be brought then more as a mindset along the entire content creation process. So starting then from the initial ideation really all the way down to monitoring and refurbishing the content. How can they bring this optimization mindset then in this process? And basically what we did was to break this process down in steps and then discuss what needs to be considered in each of these steps. So from deciding your author, your topic, the structured data that you're going to implement for your content and so on. And if I can sum the main uh, learnings in three takeaways, I would say First of all, during the entire process, we need to think about our return on investment. Uh, we all know that unfortunately, we do not have never ending capacities and resources when it comes to created content. Uh, therefore, we always need to ask ourselves, is the effort that I'm putting in optimizing my content worth it at the end of the day? For instance, it happens very often that, for example, another department or a client might reach out to the SEO team with an idea, let's say a landing page for a newsletter that looks very, very cool. And then they ask, hey, can we optimize this one? But then we, we run the numbers, we check the data, and we see that it would probably not have any potential for organic search just because search interest is not there, right? So in this case, it would not make sense or more to say, if we have limited resources, it is out of scope to prioritize the optimization for such a page, just because the return on investment at the end of the day would not make it worth a while. So that was the first thing that we discussed uh, as a main learning. And then secondly, content is king for sure. But then there's some other crucial aspects uh, and factors such as accessibility and speed that can make or break the content, no matter how good it is. And in the presentation, we use the example of a user who's coming to the page, let's say, and is trying to access our content and read through it, but then they need to wait for 10 seconds just because the website, the, the page is so slow. Let's say it's got an unlimited uh, amount of images on uh, the hero with a carousel. So obviously this is gonna take our users a lot of time to load and see. So then chances are that the visitor will simply leave the page without even reading through the content. So then all of our optimization efforts have completely gone down the drain. Um, and obviously, yes, usability and speed are things that we unfortunately can only to a certain extent control on a page level. These things are mostly tackled on a domain level and from developers, not so much from content creators. But there's still some tweaks that can be done at a page level that 
can ensure that we are optimizing as best we can, at least from our area of influence, let's say. So, for example, always making sure that our uh, images are under a certain amount of kilobytes, that they're always in the right formats and so on and so forth. Or if we don't need too many images and they're just inspirational, that we just get them out of there. Um, and then last but not least, there is obviously a bunch of EAT guidelines out there, but that does not mean that all content pieces need to abide by every single one. So uh, I like to think of the, of a difference between different use cases. So let's take, for example, an online tabloid magazine versus a, a, a website with medical advice. That's, uh, that's an example that Google also uses in, in their rater guidelines. If we have uh, a tabloid magazine online, do we really need to go to great lengths to find an expert, uh, professionally accredited, well-established author who's going to cover this topic? Or can I also cover this topic then with somebody who has what we call everyday expertise? So expertise that they've gotten over the years through experience because they're an enthusiast about the topic. Um, in this case of the tabloid magazine, it would be the latter, just because the nature of the topic mm. also does not ask for this professional accreditation. However, if we have YMYL, also known as your money or your life kind of content, so for example, a medical website, then it can even prove dangerous if we do not have an expert on the topic who is not professionally accredited for, to write medical advice financial or illegal for that matter, anything that can have at the end of the day a direct impact on the well-being of the reader who is reading it. So yeah, these were, I would say, the, the three main takeaways of the, of the, of the presentation. And um, another thing that might uh, be interesting then is that we have created a, uh, not a checklist, but um, a briefing model. So what we did, the briefing is quite important in the whole process of creating content. And uh, we have a pretty extensive briefing that we are sharing in our download section uh, together with the slides of the presentation. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we will um, put all of that into the show notes. Um, I have questions. I sort of feel that there is a battle, or maybe the battle is not really the, the best um, uh, word to describe that, but we always have, on the one hand, a client that thinks that he or they, as a company, are so special, so different, that it's going to be hard for someone external to prepare the content for them. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, as you mentioned, you were mentioning EAT, as someone who would agree with that, I mean, EAT is not someone, but, you know, EAT would say the professionals should be preparing the content. And on the other hand, we have the uh, agency who has to deliver the content, who has to prepare the content, of course, has to make sure that the content is in time and in budget. How do you feel about balancing those two and how do you attack, uh, 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 how do you talk to clients like that? Hmm. Again, I would say quite, quite important return on investment because it also depends um, when we're creating the content and when the client comes with a specific question uh, regarding the content piece, uh, it's very important to see, okay, how close are we with this content at the end to conversion? Is this something that would really play an important role in my funnel and in the conversion there? In this case, we can uh, allow ourselves to have this luxury to go and look for the perfect fit in terms of author and then to really go and take the time across all departments so sales department uh, or any pr um, marketing department or analytics bringing all the persona information that we need to really tailor this even so if even if the people who are creating the content are not in-house people which is always of course the ideal case scenario because they've been in the business for, I don't know, 10 years and they know the product inside and out. Mm, mm. Uh, we still can uh, already very well cover this if we get a briefing that is really 100% there and that really gathers all this information from relevant departments. If, however, it is a more, uh, it is a content piece that is just there to support, or if we know that it is just to drive some traffic through some relevant news regarding the industry, then it's something where we can say, if especially we're uh, uh, pressed in regards to time, we can cover this with somebody who is maybe not the expert to talk about it. And we can also 
uh, downplay a little bit the time that we'll need to re -re review it and reassess it and refurbish it and so on and so forth. So really also quite important what an importance it has, the content piece itself in the funnel. You are from, uh, you, a lot of your clients are German. That probably means that some of the content you're preparing is also German. Me coming from Slovenia, a country with 2 million people um, as a small part of Munich, um, how do you see how good is Google in understanding all of the expertise in the language in other languages that are not English? Hmm. In understanding the expertise. So, you know, my question is, um, if we, 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 Google says that it can understand if an expert wrote an article mm -hmm. um, and it can uh, use that as a measurement of how to rank that. And of course, that all goes all into the EAT. I'm not sure that it can understand that in Slovenian. How about German or maybe other languages? What do you think? I think it, it can still very well connect the dots. So let's say, okay, maybe linguistic, linguistic, purely linguistic understanding might not be at the level that it is for English, but mm. with all the information that they can find regarding the authors themselves. So there is also where all these other factors come into play. We've got the author, their profile. Do we help with extra structure data regarding our author about other topics that they're covering, previous work and publications that they've done and so on and so forth. So these are also things that can help Google connect the dots there and understand expertise in a different way uh, or in an additional way, let's say. And also then any backlinks that are coming to our specific content from other very trusted sources in the industry. Then yeah. these are other signals that Google can use to still um, evaluate our expertise on a topic, even if it's not in English. All right. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. That's great. One more question. On site, you were talking about um, content optimization. If we go to a bit more to the technical part of it or to the SEO part of it, um, on-site optimization tools. There is a lot of them on the market. Uh, there are some that are included into the big ones, like the SEM Rush has a great tool, or there are other tools that are self-standing, like um, Surfer or others. Mm -hmm. Do you have experience with any of them? Are you using some of them? What do you think are the ones that people should be using? Oh, that's that's an excellent question. We use a lot of tools, <laughs> uh. Um, uh, but uh, I would say that. Uh, well, we have a lot like write, for example, search metrics I've used. Uh, there is an excellent tool uh, in, here in Germany that is unfortunately at the moment only available, uh, available in German. It's called uh, Term Labs. I could really recommend to other German speaking colleagues. Um, but at the end of the day, I would say that nothing really replaces also the human eye. So what we do is work a lot with this. So get, for example, our readability scores and proof terms and so on and so forth to really help us to make our brief 100% full and uh, to provide us with all this data. But also at the end of the day comes the human eye that will go through the briefing, make sure that everything is in order, that the main content that we're seeing on average for our competitors actually does make sense, or do we even need to go beyond what the tool is saying to us and look and think a little bit outside the box and give some other uh, mm. directives from ourselves. So it's always a mixture. There's obviously many, many good tools out there, though. All right. We'll link to Term Labs um, for the German audience. I think that's it. Um, Despina, where can people find you? Do you have any future conference appearances? Uh, what are the links where people can talk to you about uh, content and SEO? Um, I would say either my LinkedIn profile or Twitter is at the uh, or they can also contact us through our uh, through our email for the boutique agency. Uh, no up and coming conferences, but. SMX being my first, I quite enjoyed it. So I would say uh, I'll probably be on the look for other instances like this. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Despina, thank you very much for being on the podcast and have a great day in snowy Munich. Thank you, Peter. Likewise. Bye. Bye.